thank you, Sushma, for praying. <clears throat> we'll come to the 16th verse of the third chapter of the book of Revelation, the letter to the uh, church in Laodicea. And before we carry on from verse 17, I want us to remind ourselves that uh, in those churches, in the congregations, there were all kinds of people. There were genuine believers, there were people who tested the love of God, the grace of God, but not given their lives to Christ, no Christ in them. There were uh, inquirers, seekers, scoffers, mockers, journalists, reporters, spectators, all kinds of people. Like today also in most churches, on a given Sunday when you go there, there are all kinds of people there. So that's why you'll find in the letters, there are some commendations and some warnings. Commendations for those who are walking with the Lord, who are faithful to God, and warnings for those who take God's grace for granted. For example, in Jude 4, we read, Jude writes about godless people who have slipped in among you. They slipped into the church congregations who chain the grace of God as a license for immorality. As compared to those who understood the grace of God, and Titus 2.11 talks about such people, where the grace of God motivates them to say no to ungodliness. The same grace, but some people take it for granted, godless people, no Christ in them, but they've tasted the grace of God. Others who understood the true grace of God turn from iniquity. So we'll find there are warnings and commendations in every letter, and we must see where we stand. And, and thankfully, we're all believers, so we have to learn from the commendations and imitate the lives of those who walk in the Spirit. Let's go to verse 17. In verse 17, uh, the Lord tells to the church, you say, I am rich, I've acquired wealth, and do not need a thing. But you don't realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. You say, I am rich. And the word for Greek, uh, in Greek for rich is plausios. Plausios, which means wealthy. They think I'm wealthy, and they sometimes people think that uh, uh, godliness is a means to financial gain. Uh, Paul wrote Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 5 about some people who think that godliness is a means to financial gain. They pursue after prosperity, material prosperity, and they think that is Christian life. And they say, I'm rich, I'm wealthy, I don't need a thing. And they think that because you are financially wealthy, that God is pleased with you. When Jesus spoke about abundant life, abundant life, he qualifies in Luke 12, 15 by saying, Luke chapter 12, verse 15, a man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. That's God. Uh, God definitely gives some people more possessions than others, no doubt about it. But please remember, rich and poor are relative. They are relative terms. Every one of us is rich compared to most people in our country in India. And uh, every one of us is poor compared to the richest people in our country. So rich or poor is basically relative. But the abundant life God has promised is abundance of peace, joy, freedom from anxiety and fear, reigning in life over every problem, and having close, intimate fellowship with God. That is true life. So here he's saying to people who say, I don't need anything, I'm fine. And their pursuit of Christ is just to get financial gain. There are many people like that, even today. The first century church, more than 5,000 were fed with five loaves of bread and two fish. Later on, 4,000. So many were healed of uh, demonic possession, healed of diseases and sicknesses. So many were healed. How many were there waiting for the anointing after he rose from the dead? Only 120. Where were the remaining? They're all following the world. So people believe in Christ for different reasons. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 15, 19, Paul writes, if you're only for things of this world, you have hope in Christ. You should be pitied more than all people. When you come to the verse, pity, you're pitiable, he says. If only for things of this world, you believe in Christ, you should be pitied. There's so much more. The main thing is resurrection, the hope of the resurrection. So here he says, you say, I'm rich, I've acquired a thing, I've acquired wealth, don't need a thing. 
but you don't realize you are wretched. Pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I'm going to explain each one of this. Wretched. The word wretched is from a word called talaiporos in Greek, which means miserable. You think you're very rich, you got a lot of money, but in your heart, you're miserable. And these people are people who did not have Christ in their hearts. They had acquired, they had, they had uh, believed in Christ for many reasons, material reasons, but then no Christ in the heart. So when difficulties come, they are not able to handle it. So you are miserable. Inside you are miserable. Outside you are showing off. And therefore, you are miserable, in meaning wretched, pitiful. Like I told you, when people believe in and the Bible, is not, I'm not telling you, I'm only quoting uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 19. If only for things of this world, we have hope in Christ, we are pitied more than all people. So you are pitiful. pitiful. Only for things of this world, we are acquiring wealth, you believe in Jesus. I feel sorry for you. There's so much more available for you. But you're not interested in those things. You're only uh, concerned about the material blessings. And therefore, you're, you're pitiful. Poor, blind, and naked. Poor, spiritually poor. Financially very, very rich, but spiritually poor. When the Apostle Paul was uh, poor financially, what was he doing? He was making others rich. Second Corinthians 6, chapter verse 10. Poor, yet making many rich. Poor financially at that point of time, but making others spiritually rich. When you share about Jesus, when you share about uh, those, those who do not know about Christ, share Christ, you're making them rich spiritually. When those who are in Christ, you share the word of God to bless them, you make them even more richer spiritually. That's what Paul was doing. And when we invest our time to bless people, to build them up, then they become rich and we become rich spiritually. And therefore, let's understand true riches are spiritual. Material are, are, are important, but not don't run behind those things. Because you run behind those things, now you, there are all kinds of troubles will come. 1 Timothy 6.10 says, For the love of money is the root of all kinds of people. Some people eager for money have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Let's go on. Poor, blind. Spiritually blind. Physically maybe you see, but spiritually blind. We don't know God. We don't have a relationship with God. Like I said, they have tasted the grace of God. Tasted the blessings of God, but then not known God. When they have a heart for God, God reveals themselves to, to them because in Jeremiah 29 13, God says, You will seek me and find me, if you seek me with all your heart. When the heart is open to God, God will give a revelation of Christ to them for them to receive Christ into the hearts as Savior and Lord. Finally, it says, You are naked. Naked means all your sins are exposed before God. Nothing can be hidden from God. In Hebrews chapter 4, verse 13, it's written, Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of Him, to whom we have to give an account. Now, some people who have an exterior of, exterior of blessings and uh, blessings of God and wealth and possessions and power and popularity, they hide behind that, uh, that, that face before people, the facade. They hide behind that. They think no one knows. But some people think they can hide from God. And the Lord says in the book of Jeremiah, 23rd chapter, verses 23 and 24, Am I only a God nearby, not a God far away? Can anyone hide in secret places that I don't see him? Do I not fill heaven and earth? So God is saying, you are naked. I know everything about you. Don't try to hide from me. No one can hide from God. So these people apparently had tasted the grace of God. They are part of the congregation in Laodicea. And by the way, I must tell you this. Laodicea was the church where uh, the, the letter to the Colossians was to be read out. Last time I mentioned Ephesus. Right? Ephesus is Colossians. Colossians chapter 4, 14, 15. 
where writer uh, Paul writes to church in Colossae. This letter read out to those in Laodicea. And read out in your church the Laodicean letter, which means Paul wrote a letter in Laodicea also, which is not part of the Bible, and what letter he wrote. But the Ephesians knew that. So there was a, there was a sort of a fellowship between the Laodicean church and Colossian church. And Colossae was very nearby to uh, Laodicea also, and closer to Ephesus, actually. Only 160 kilometers from Ephesus, 100 miles from Ephesus was uh, Colossae. So Colossae, Laodicea, all the churches are very, very close by. And uh, uh, yeah, so that, that, that's a background to church in Laodicea. Verse 18, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire. So you can become rich. You are materially rich in terms of money, <coughs> in terms of possession, but I want you to become spiritually rich. I want you to buy from me gold refined through fire. First of all, to believe in Christ, to be saved. That is ultimate riches. And as you follow him, you have difficulties and those difficulties make you increase, it'll make you increase in faith. So let's turn to the book of Isaiah. I'm going to ask Nick to read. Isaiah chapter 55, verse 1 and 2. Could you please read, Nick? Isaiah chapter sure. 55, verse 1 and 2. Yeah. Come, all who are thirsty, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Okay. Why spend money? No. Yes, up there. Okay. Buy without paying money. How can you buy without paying money? And it's actually referring to salvation and the blessings to salvation. And uh, we come to the Lord, thirsty for the Lord. And remember that God has given Isaiah a vision of Christ on the cross. He saw Christ on the cross in the vision. He wrote about that one in the whole book of Isaiah. That's why the fifth chapter of Isaiah is, talks about in the past tense about Christ on the cross. In the past tense, not future tense. Isaiah 53.5, he was pierced for our transgressions, the crush for our iniquities. The punishment that brought his peace was upon him. By his wounds, we are healed. After giving Isaiah a vision of the cross, the Lord tells Isaiah, tell the people, come, buy and eat. And buy without paying. Salvation can't be bought. We receive it. So here the same thing, sentiments I mentioned. He says, I want you to buy from me Gold refined in the fire. So you can become rich. That riches, those riches are actually spiritual riches. And gold refined through fire is the fact that as we obey God, we'll face difficulties. So difficulties will come to refine our faith. In 1 Peter chapter 1, 6 and 7, Peter writes about how by living in this world, we have to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. Having come to receive this gift of salvation without payment, without any payment, we buy, buy that. Buy means it's not purchasing, but receiving from God. Then you obey him. As you obey him, we face difficulties. And in Peter writes there about these trials, verse 7, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 7, these have come out of faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine, may result in praise, glory, and honor, when Jesus Christ is revealed. So actually, gold refined through fire is our faith being refined through trials. It's come to me. And this faith is a gift of God to Christ. Hebrews 12, 2. Jesus is the author and perfecter of faith. As we receive faith from him, faith is also manifested as we obey, uh, hear the word of God, obey it, and we go through trials, and those trials make our faith strong. Gold refined through fire. That's why even in the book of Job we read, when Job went through all the trials, in the book of Job, 23rd chapter verse 10, he says, after he has tested me, I'll come forth like gold. After he's tested me, after he's refined me. So this gold refined through fire is a faith being made strong through difficulties we face because we obey God. In that process, we become rich, rich in faith. We may be financially poor, but rich in faith. 
It's amazing to see how the beautiful the Baruch was connected. In James 2.5, James writes, Has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith? God has chosen those who are poor in the world. world worldly riches, very poor. Poor people. Not much resources they have. They are rich in faith. They go through difficulties. And they go through difficulties. They have the faith in Jesus. They, their whole life centered on Christ. So they are actually rich. This is how you can become rich. Seek faith from me. Seek my heart and mind and obey me. You have difficulties and they will make you strong in faith. The gold refined through fire. And the second part of verse 18, so you can become rich and white clothes to wear. So you can cover your shameful nakedness. The nakedness I told is basically a sins being exposed before God. But then, by the blood of Christ, they are made clean, made white. White clothes to us, basically, sins being removed. In the Old Testament time, we read Isaiah chapter 1, 18 19. Come, let's reason together, says the Lord. Even though sins are like scarlet, scarlet, they should be white as snow. Even though they are red as crimson, they should be white as wool. For willing and obedient, we need the best of the land. So when you're willing to receive this gift of salvation and obey God, you need the best of the land. Not just be in the land, be in the kingdom of God, but enjoy the best in the kingdom of God as we obey Him. So it's all beautifully connected. The whole Bible is beautifully connected. White clothes to wear. So we can cover a shameful nakedness. There is the sins being exposed. Uncleanness of heart, cleansed by the blood of Christ. You look at um, Hebrews 10, 20, it says, our hearts are sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience. Not only did we cleanse a guilty conscience, that we serve God. Hebrews 9, 13, 14. The blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkle those sprinkled ceremony unclean, sanctify them the outwardly clean. How much more than will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences, no matter lead to that, so we may serve the living God. So serve the living God. Only by the blood of Christ we are qualified to serve God. Okay. Then he goes on to say, salve to put on the eye so you can see. It's not physical seeing, but spiritual sin. I mean, to experience God, sal means healing. So as your heal, eyes are healed, spiritual eyes are healed, you can have an experience with God and we can know Him more and more and that is true riches. Knowing God more and more are actually true riches. Verse 19. Those whom I love are rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Now, look at the previous verses. It seems to be very hard. Uh, you're wretched, miserable, poor, blind, naked. It seems to be very, very difficult to accept. But it's a reality. But God loves them. He said, I wrote all these things because I love you. Those whom I love are rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Okay, could someone read, uh, uh, Nick could read Hebrews chapter 12, uh, 5 to 11, in the context of God rebuking those whom he loves. Yeah. And you have forgotten that word of encouragement that addresses you as sons. My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you. Because the Lord disciplines those he loves and he punishes everyone he accepts as a son. Endure hardship as discipline, God is treating you as sons. For what son is not disciplined by his father? If you are not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are illegitimate children and not true sons. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the father of our spirits and live? Our fathers disciplined us for a little while as they thought best. But God disciplines us for our good, that we may share in his holiness. 
No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. And this passage is very self-explanatory. Because he loves us, he disciplines us. And that's why you find the Old Testament also. Amos chapter 3, verse 2, God says, You only have a chosen among all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for your sins. He has a very high standard for his people who have received grace. And therefore, we take heed to his discipline, his correction, for our own good. So while certain things mentioned here in the letter are very hard to accept for certain people, when we understand God disciplines because he loves us, we'll gladly accept discipline because in the end, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace to those who are trained by it. In fact, after we are disciplined, we shall even move in his holiness. So key in Christian life is always accepting any correction that God gives to us, either directly from him or even through people whom God uses to discipline us. Now let's come to a very important verse, very often misunderstood. Verse 20. Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. Now, this verse is a very misunderstood verse. Is, the people say it's written to a church. So how is God waiting outside the church? The fact is, in every congregation, like I told you, there were believers, there were unbelievers. And even the unbelievers taste the grace of God. Answers to prayers, physical healing, mental healing, so many good things they experience. And every time they hear the word of God, God is speaking to them. I knock at uh, the door of your heart. Send the door. Now, what door is that? Door of the heart. I'm knocking. If anyone opens the door, I will come in, eat with them, and he with me. Now, eating with someone in, the, in that context, in that culture, is having fellowship with the person. That's why the, they used to meet in the homes and break bread. So, eat, coming and eating in the house means I will come into you, into your house. We'll eat together. We'll have fellowship together. Lord wants to have fellowship with his people. But unless we invite him, he won't come into our hearts. He said, keep on knocking at the door of your heart. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. So there are people, there are people in the Laodicean church who had not received Christ in the hearts of Savior and Lord. And every Sunday, every time they hear the word of God, God is knocking through people he speaks, knocks the door of the heart. Open the heart, he will come into our hearts and for us to have fellowship with him. Eating with the person in those days means having fellowship with him. That's why Jews would not eat with the Gentiles or Samaritans because they have, can't have fellowship. So eating with someone is having fellowship. The Lord says, I want to have fellowship with you. You tasted my grace, you tasted my blessings, but then I want to come into your heart. I want to live my life through you. In John chapter 1, 10, 11, 12, we read, John writes about Jesus. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came that which was his own. His own did not receive him. Yet to all who received him, meaning opening the door, he knocks at the door, open the door, receive him. To believe his name, God gave the right to become children of God. At that point of time, we become children of God. From that point of time, we can have fellowship with him. We talk to him, he talks to us. Because he lives inside us. So always knocking at the door, he won't make a forced entry. He'll never push himself. God never pushes himself. With regard to the will of God also, he'll never force us to do his will. He will reveal his will. He won't force his will. So this verse is written to all those people in the congregation in Laodicea who think they are rich, have acquired wealth, but he said, you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, naked. Come buy wine, free of cost. I'm knocking at your door. When I come out your heart, you will receive me, you will receive my blessings, you become rich. And as you obey me, you will face difficulties. And as you rejoice in difficulties, what happens is, it's like gold refined through the fire. Your faith becomes refined. 
That's the context of this particular very misunderstood verse this is. But the fact is, it's for people who may or may not taste with God, but when God's word comes to us, he's knocking at our door of heart. That will open the door. Lord, come into my heart, be my Savior and Lord. And surely he will come in and live in us forever and ever. So much so we can choose to have fellowship with him. He's right in our hearts. That's why in 2 Corinthians 13, 14, to the church, Paul writes, now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. So the key starting point of Christian life of having fellowship with him is open door of heart and said, Jesus, come into my heart, be my Savior and Lord. If anyone of this group has not done that, please receive Christ into heart right now after the meeting is over. I will show he lives inside you. He will come into heart only when we open our hearts. As you hear the word of God, he's knocking, he's knocking from externally. Open the door of the heart, he'll come in and we eat with him, he eat with us, meaning we have fellowship with him, constant fellowship. And we can choose to have fellowship every moment of our lives. We're called to be people who pray without ceasing from time to time, whole day. First Thessalonians 5, 7, that happens, it starts to happen at the point of time, we receive into hearts the Savior and Lord. Let me go on. Verse 21, 22. To the one who is victorious, I'll give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I was victorious and sat down to the Father on his throne. Sit with me on my throne. How wonderful. How many people will sit there? I don't know. <laughs> but we'll have a spiritual body, not a physical body. Physical body means we can't sit with them on the throne. It's a different kind of realm, spiritual realm. But I'll just take the word as it is. Jesus is saying that. When you overcome, you sit with me on my throne. That's how I overcame, sat with the Father, with the Father on his throne. So the same throne on the right side of the Father is Jesus, and they're going to be there with him. Now we know why John and James want to be at the right and left hand of Jesus. And Jesus said this, he said by the Father, not by me. Anyway, I don't know how it's going to be, but God wants us to be victorious and he will make us victorious. Ask him for faith. Faith is actually buying gold. Gold refined through fire is faith becoming very strong. And freely we receive this gift of faith. Every gift of God is given by grace. Being a gift, it can't be earned, it's received. So ask God for the gift of faith to be able to obey him, to please him, to walk with him. When difficulties come, realize that these have come, that a faith gets refined, like gold refined through fire, a faith gets refined. Ultimately, we're saved by faith, we live by faith, and we walk by faith. Verse 22. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the priest says to the churches. To the churches, plural. It's written to the Laodicean church, but we also come in there. All the churches, although it's specific for the Laodicean church, he understand this particular letter in his context, apply in our context. So all churches today, all over the world, figure somewhere. Somewhere we figure in. You must ask God, Lord, where do I figure in this? Take to heed, thank God for the commendation and thank him also for the warnings and the rebuking. We become better instruments in God's hands. God bless you all. And next, on Friday, we're going to the fourth chapter. Very exciting. It is going to be fourth and fifth chapter about throne in heaven. Praise God for that. Come prepared on, on, on Friday. God bless you all.